In this chapter, we're going to talk about the money supply. Um, we're going to think first about what money is, why we use it, the functions that it serves. Then we're going to think about the uh, Federal Reserve System, which is the um, group that's in charge of monitoring and controlling the money supply in the United States. And then we'll think about a few of the challenges that the Federal Reserve has in controlling the money supply. But let's think first about money and what it is and why we use it. So we use money, if you think about what happens, let's think about uh, if you take a dollar and you go buy something with it. What you're doing is you're exchanging this piece of paper, which in and of itself has no intrinsic value. That piece of paper that, it's, that is, is actually the dollar really isn't useful for anything else other than to exchange for something that you want to buy. So if you think about what's going on there, you're exchanging something that, that has no value in and of itself for something that does have value. Now, the dollar has value, but we're going to talk about where that value comes from. It's not because of the paper that it's printed on. If you look at the other alternative to using money, we could rely on a barter system, and if you look at some, in some situations, there may be times when you have to rely on barter, but barter is just the trading of one good or service for another good or service, and the problem with barter, obviously, is that it requires a mutual coincidence of wants. It, it requires each person to want what the other person has. Um, so if one side doesn't want what the other one is offering in trade, then the other one's going to have to go trade somebody else for what this person wants, and it, it, it's just an inefficient way to conduct transactions. Money is a much more useful way because when you accept money, you know that you can turn around and turn that into anything you want. Anybody else will accept that in exchange because they know they can turn it into anything they want. So the, one of the advantages of money is that it doesn't require this, this double coincidence of wants or mutual coincidence of wants. So let's think about what we mean when, when we use this term money. And if you think about how you use that term just in, in everyday language, typically the way that people use it is to refer to wealth. So if, if you were in a conversation with somebody and they asked you, how much money does that person have? You would understand that as them asking you, you know, how, do they have a lot of, of wealth, a lot of assets? In an economics class, we're going to define it um, a little more narrowly. So we're going to be thinking about um, money, the definition of money, as the set of all assets in the economy that people regularly use to exchange for goods and services. So that's the definition that we're going to use. The set of assets in the economy people regularly use to exchange for goods and services. So let's think about some of the functions of money. Um, there are three that we're going to think about. The first one is that it serves as a medium of exchange, which I've been talking about here. You know that you can exchange your money for whatever you want. You can turn it into a meal or you can turn it into a movie or you can turn it into a pair of shoes or you can buy an economics lecture with it. You can turn your money into whatever you want. Um, that's probably the most obvious and, and most useful um, function that money plays. The second one though is that we can use it as a unit of account. And what this means is that dollars are the yardstick that we use to post prices um, and record debts. We wouldn't have to use dollars. We could use something else. There used to be a TV commercial where um, one lady was talking to another lady and she asked the lady, second lady how much the sweater she had bought cost and she gave her some dollar amount, $50. And the first lady said, wow, that's 50 Wendy's crispy chicken sandwiches. And I always thought it was funny as an economist. My family never laughed at it. But I thought it was funny because 
the whole point was that the first lady's unit of account was Wendy's crispy chicken sandwiches. And so you may have your own unit of account, but when you deal with other people, we all understand that prices are posted in dollars. So it serves as a unit of account. The third is that it serves as a store of value. So you can accumulate money and hold it, say, in a checking account, or you could hold currency in a jar buried in your backyard, and it can serve as a store of value. Now, how well it functions as a store of value, that's a whole different matter. If you think about ways, different types of assets and how they differ in terms of, of their suitability as a store of value, currency probably is not one of the better ones. Other things can serve as a store of value. You can have uh, real estate. You could buy a house and that could serve as a store of value. Um, but all assets, also you need to think about the liquidity of that asset and the liquidity should have liquidity. Liquidity of the asset is the speed with which you can turn it into the economy's uh, medium of exchange. So how quickly can you turn it into dollars? Well, if you're thinking about money, it already is the medium of exchange. So if you have dollars that are sitting in a checking account, you can go out right now and buy groceries with them. But if you have some of your wealth in the form of a house, you can't go to a store and buy groceries with your house. What you would need to do is first turn it into dollars, sell the house, and then you could go out with that money and buy whatever you needed to buy. So a house is less liquid than dollars are. Okay, so in terms of a store of value, that's one thing to uh, consider. Remember that if you're holding currency, the real rate of return on currency has a, a zero nominal rate of return. So the real rate of return is negative the inflation rate. So it may not be probably not the best store of value. That doesn't mean you don't want to hold some currency you probably, or some money. You need to do that to make transactions, but you need to be careful about how much. So now let's think about different kinds of money. The first thing, so let's put these over here, different kinds of money. If we think about commodity money, what we mean by commodity money is that the money itself takes the form of some commodity with intrinsic value. So examples of this might be gold or silver. And at different times historically, um, the U.S. has used gold or silver or certificates that are backed by gold or silver. Um, when you have an economy that is operating with um, currency that is either in the form of gold or in the form of certificates that are backed by gold, we would say that that, that economy is operating on the gold standard. And the United States used to do that, does not currently. Um, Other things can serve as money in other situations. So there are examples of, uh, say, prisoner of war camps where currency, the, the money that is used is, say, cigarettes or, say, in the uh, prison system. Turns out that uh, the, the typical money now used in the prison system is ramen noodles. So if you've got ramen noodles, you can use that to buy other um, goods and services that you might need to buy in prison. Um, we don't use commodity money. Most economies don't. We use what's referred to as fiat money. Fiat money is what we call it when the money itself is not backed by a commodity or made out of a commodity. Okay? A fiat is simply a government decree. And so if you look at a, a piece of currency, you'll see that this, it written on there, this uh, bill is good um, for all debts, public and private. It's legal tender. And that means that the government has decreed that everybody has to accept that in return for goods and services. Um, so the value of the dollar in a fiat currency system, a fiat money system, the value comes from people's faith that the government is going to be around in the future. If people believed that the government, the U.S. government was not going to exist next year, 
then the dollar would lose its value. So if you go back and you look at the fall of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union never abandoned the ruble. The ruble was always the official currency, but prior to the fall of the Soviet Union, as people saw what was coming down the road, the, the ruble became worthless. People burned them for heat. So um, our dollars, our money has value, but that value comes from the fact that the government has decreed that they are legal tender. Let's think about a few, so those are the two types of money that we're going to think about. Let's think about uh, money in the U.S. economy. So if we think about the way that works, let me give you a couple of definitions. Let's start by this, with this definition, the money stock. And I will also refer to this as the money supply. I, I tend to use them interchangeably. But what we're thinking about when, we, when I use the word money stock or money supply is the total amount of money that is in the system. Okay, so we're thinking about the amount, if we're talking about the U.S. system, we would be thinking about the amount of money that is in the U.S. system. And that money is going to be made up of a couple of different things. It's going to be made up of currency. And so we're going to be thinking there of paper bills and coins. And actually, that's what most people think of when they hear the word money. At least if I were to stop right now and say, what do you think of when, when I'm using this word money right now? What's going through your mind? Most people would say, well, you're talking about paper bills. But we're actually talking about more than that because we're also talking about demand deposits. So dollars that are in demand deposits would be counted as money because you can go out with your debit card or with a check and you can buy... Um, goods and services. You could go to the grocery store with a debit card and you could buy what you need. And so those dollars are in a demand deposit. That's what we refer to a checking account as because your money is available to you on demand. If we think about um, say money in a savings account, it's a little less clear um, whether or not we're going to count that in money and I'll explain that here in just a second, um, but typically with savings account dollars, you're not able to go out and buy groceries with them. What you would need to do is transfer money from your savings account to your checking account, and then you could um, use your debit card or, or withdraw money or write a check. Um, so dollars that are in a savings account, that's very close to what we're talking about here, but not quite um, the exact same as currency or demand deposits. We've actually got a couple of uh, different definitions, official definitions for the money stock that we're going to think about here. There are more than this, but let's think about what we refer to as M1. M1 is the most liquid of money. This is what we, where we put, say, currency. We put demand deposits in there. We put um, traveler's checks. And then we could put a category in here that we just call other checkable deposits. A checkable deposit simply is a place where your money is being held and you can write a check on it or use your debit card. So that's M1. Those are the things you can go out right now with and buy what you need to buy. There's also what we call M2. M2 is going to include everything in M1. So let's put M1 in there. M2 includes all of this stuff, but it also includes some other slightly less liquid assets. So in M2, we're going to have M1 plus um, savings deposits. So those are just slightly less liquid. You would need to uh, transfer money from savings into your checking account before you could actually buy something with it. Um, there are other things we can put in here. Money market mutual funds. Um, 
maybe small time deposits. And we don't need to worry about exactly what those things are. They are just um, ways to um, store your purchasing power for the future and they're not quite as liquid as uh, what's included up here in M1. We could just put other minor assets, let's say other minor categories of assets. Oops. Other minor categories of assets. So this gives you an idea of the official way that we break down um, the money stock or the money supply. We can think about the most liquid and then M2 includes all of that stuff plus some slightly less liquid um, categories. So if you think about in the US economy at least how much money is in each of these categories it, it changes but if you think about um, just roughly what the size of these are this is around 3,202 billion. It's a lot of money. M2 is bigger because of course it includes all of this plus some other stuff this is about 12,467 billion dollars. And I think those numbers were say sometime around 2016. Knowing the exact numbers is not important. It just gives you an idea of kind of the rough size, roughly how big the money stock is, how big the money supply is. What we need to do now is talk about the Federal Reserve System. So I'm going to clear this off and then we'll talk about how the, the Fed works. All right, let's think about the Federal Reserve System. So we abbreviate the Federal Reserve System with the term Fed. So I'll, I'll use that term. I may still call it the Federal Reserve System, but if you hear me just say the Fed, that's what I'm referring to. And the Fed for the United States is our example of a central bank. And what a central bank is, is a bank for any economy that oversees the banking system and, and typically monitors the money supply, controls the money supply. So if you look at the top of, say, a, a dollar bill or any bill, any piece of currency, you'll see that it says Federal Reserve Note at the top. And that's just an indication that it's the Fed that is in charge of uh, monitoring and controlling the money supply. So if we think about how the Fed is organized, just a little background information. It was organized in uh, 1914, so it's been around for a long time. It was organized after a series of bank failures in the early 1900s. So what happened in the early 1900s was there were some banks that were having problems. Um, the general public heard about those problems. And when you hear that your bank is struggling, probably the first thing that goes through your mind is I need to go get my money out of that bank before it goes out of business. The problem is that when everybody goes and gets their money out of the bank, that pretty much guarantees that the bank is going to um, struggle and we'll talk about why here in a little bit. But those early bank failures led to the organization of the Fed and the Fed um, will talk about its job. There have been times in history when it hasn't done its job very well um, and, and we'll come back to that later on. But for now, let's just start with the fact that it was organized in 1914. It's run by a board of governors. So we've got a board of governors. There's seven members. Those seven members are appointed by the president and confirmed by Congress. They serve 14 year terms. The reason they serve terms that are that long is that we want to try to insulate them from the political process. If there were shorter terms, then any in new president would be able to appoint persons, people that they want to the Federal Reserve and in that way maybe exert some influence over the Federal Reserve and we don't want that. We want the Federal Reserve to be as free as possible from the political system because they're going to make their decisions um, regardless of what Congress wants or regardless of what the president wants. So we've got seven members, 14-year terms. The chairman of the Federal Reserve 
serves a four-year term. Oops, chairman of the Fed serves a four-year term. Again, appointed by the president, confirmed by Congress. And if you look at kind of the recent history of um, the people that have held the office of chair of the Federal Reserve, um, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, um, Jerome Powell, those are all people that have uh, served recently as the chairman of the Federal Reserve, typically an economist. Um, so if we think about the makeup of the Federal Reserve, it's made up of several different banks. So it's made up of 12 regional banks. Twelve regional banks, and then of course the board that is in Washington, D.C. Let's talk about the jobs of the Fed. So the Fed has two main jobs. The first one is to regulate banks and ensure the health of the banking system. So let's just put that down here as health of the banking system. So the Fed is the organization that clears checks. So if you were to write a check, and I realize not a lot of people these days write checks, you might just use your debit card, but it's the same thing as writing a check. When you authorize some of your purchasing power to go to somebody else, it is the Fed that makes sure that you've got that amount of purchasing power and that that purchasing power gets transferred from your account to the account of whoever you purchased the uh, item from. So they, they clear checks. That's what we refer to as clearing checks. And then they act as the banker's bank. Um, so what that means is that the Fed makes loans to any bank that needs to borrow from them. And so there may be times when a bank finds itself short of, of funds. And in that case, a bank can borrow from another bank. When a bank borrows from another bank, we, we call the interest rate that that other bank charges, we call that the federal funds rate. But the Fed, or the, a bank can also borrow from the Fed, and when a bank borrows from the Fed, we call the interest rate the discount rate. So the Fed serves essentially as the lender of last resort to a bank. So the Fed is the lender of last resort. And what that means is, a bank may find itself in a situation where another bank may not want to lend to it. And in that case, their last resort is to go to the Fed. And of course, the Fed is going to charge them that discount rate. So that's the first job, to monitor the health of the banking system, um, to help banks out when a bank finds itself in a situation where it uh, needs to borrow. The second job of the Fed is to control the quantity of money. Control the money stock. Let's just say quantity of money. And the policy that the Fed uses to control the quantity of money, we call that monetary policy. So the Fed makes monetary policy. The group within the Fed that is in charge of making monetary policy, we call the Federal Open Market Committee. Federal Open Market Committee, I'm going to just abbreviate that. We abbreviate it FOMC, so I will probably refer to, as, refer to it as the FOMC. So the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, has the ability to increase or decrease the money supply, and the way that they do that is through purchase and sale of U.S. government bonds. 
And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit, exactly how that happens. What we want to do first, though, is we want to think about the relationship between the banking system and the money supply. So the job of controlling the quantity of money, when you first hear that, it's probably tempting to think, well, that, that seems like it should be pretty easy because all the Fed would need to do is either print some more money and put it into the system or somehow pull some money out of the system. But it doesn't seem at first glance as if this is going to be that challenging. Turns out it's, it's actually very challenging. So let's think about the relationship between banks and the money supply. So let's start this by thinking about a situation where there's no bank. So let's suppose we've got a, a little economy here. Usually, um, if this was a face-to-face -face class and we were sitting in a room and there were several of us, I would say, let's pretend as if all of us in this room are an economy. And right now, there's no bank. So if you've got some money, then that means you have to keep it in your pocket, right? And you can exchange it with other people in this room in return for goods and services, but there's not going to be any, be any banking system. Let's start by thinking about currency, that amount of currency. Currency is the only money. And let's suppose that there is $100 worth of currency in the system currently. So all of us in the room together, if we looked at how much money all of us have, it's $100 in the form of paper bills. And again, we can, we can exchange those with each other if we want to buy stuff from other people in the room. So at this point, the money supply is $100. And that $100 is in the form of currency. Now let's suppose a bank opens. So suppose a bank opens and let's suppose that the only thing that this bank is going to do is give you a safe place to keep your money. So the bank will accept deposits and they're not going to do anything other than hang on to your deposit and then if you want to write a check to somebody else, then they'll transfer purchasing power for you, from your account to the other person's account, and you don't have to handle any of your money. It just gives you a safe place to keep your purchasing power. So let's suppose the bank is going to keep, it's not going to lend out any of that money. The $100 will be kept in reserve. So the $100 is kept in reserve. So the bank is going to accept deposits, and let's suppose we all deposit all of our money into this bank, and then they just allow us to use a debit card or write a check. Okay, so now the money supply is still 100, but the nature of the money supply has changed. What we've got now is $100, let's put here the money supply is still equal to $100, but the nature of it is that it's not currency in, in circulation now, it's $100 in demand deposits. We call this, we'll come back to this here in a little bit, but we call this when the bank holds all of its money in reserve and lends nothing out, we call that a 100% reserve system. Okay? Banks do lend it out, but we're going to start here to see what happens to the money supply when they start lending it out. So let's think about what we're going to call a T account. Okay, so what we want to do now is think about the T account for this bank. And a T account is going to have over here on this side, we're going to have the assets of the bank. Let me move that down. We're going to have the assets of the bank and we're going to have the liabilities. So here's our T account. In terms of the assets, the bank has taken in $100 of deposit and it's holding those deposits as reserves. So it has reserves 
of $100. Those deposits that it has accepted, those are also a liability for the bank. They are liable to that. If you wanted to withdraw your money at any time, you can. We call it a demand deposit. So it has deposits of $100. And our assets and liabilities have to balance each other. So it has an asset that $100 in reserves that's sitting in its vault, but it's also liable to its depositors for that $100. So the amount of the money supply hasn't changed, it's just the nature of it has changed. It went from being currency that we were transacting with each other to now it being demand deposits where we're not transacting currency, we're just using maybe writing a check or using our um, debit card. So if the bank does not lend any money, if they just hold all of their money on, in reserve, the money, the magnitude of the money supply does not change. Now let's think about what we call fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking. What this means is that rather than holding all $100 in reserve, they're going to hold a fraction of that. And they're going to take the other part of it that they're not holding in reserve and they're going to lend that out. Okay. So let's suppose, well, let's talk about a couple of terms first. The fraction that is held, we call the reserve ratio. So the reserve ratio this is the fraction the bank holds in reserve. Now the Fed places a minimum. The Fed regulates what the fraction has to be and the, the mandated minimum that the Fed establishes we call the reserve requirement. Okay. A bank can hold more than it has to. It doesn't have to hold the minimum. It doesn't have to hold exactly the reserve requirement, but they can't hold less than that. So let's, let me clear this off and then we'll think about what happens when this bank lends out some of this money. So I've got my T account for this bank, moved it from over there to over here. Now let's just see what happens when this bank decides to lend out some of the money. Let's suppose that the bank keeps 10%. So the bank keeps 10%. They're going to keep that in reserve and then they're going to lend out 90%. So the reserve ratio that they are keeping is one tenth, okay, 10%. So now let's think about what happens to the T account of the bank because things have changed a little bit. If we think about how this is going to affect the assets and liabilities, let's put again our assets over here, our liabilities over here. They always have to balance each other, but now the assets of the bank have changed. So it's going to have reserves now, not of $100, but of $10. and it's going to have made loans of $90. So it now has two types of assets. Its liabilities haven't changed. It is still liable to its depositors for that $100 worth of deposits. So now let's think about what has happened to the money supply because the magnitude of the money supply has now changed. If we think about the money supply, the depositors still have $100 worth of demand deposits, but now the borrowers from the bank have $90 of currency. And that $90 of currency is now out in the system circulating. So the money supply has now gone from $100 to 
the bank, by lending out, by making this loan to people of $90, it actually increases the money supply. Notice that the Fed hasn't done anything here. And notice that the number of paper dollars in the system has not changed. But the money supply has changed. So this is an important thing to keep in mind right now. When we talk about the amount of money, it's tempting for students to think that, that there's a paper dollar for every dollar in the system. And that's simply not true. What's going on here is that our money supply is almost $200 and there's only $100 worth of currency in the system. Okay? So our money supply has changed. What we get here is an important result and that is that when banks only hold a fraction of their deposits and they lend the rest out, they are actually creating money. So banks create money. Banks have an impact on the money supply. Now, let's also keep in mind that the bank is not creating wealth. People are not wealthier than before because these people who have borrowed this money, they have incurred debt. So they have to pay this money back. So even though the money supply is bigger, there is not more wealth in the system. What, what has happened though is that the economy has become more liquid. There is more of the medium of exchange, dollars, out there in the system. Okay? What we need to talk about now is what we call the money multiplier. So what this is going to help us understand is how much impact fractional reserve banking has on the money supply because this is not the end of the story. So let's think about um, what happens when these people who have borrowed this $90, they're going to go out and they're going to buy things with that $90. They're going to pay other people with the $90. And those other people that now have sold those things are going to have some currency. And let's suppose they deposit that $90 into a different bank. Okay, so let's suppose that we think about the T account for the second bank. So let's make sure that we write this out. This is the T account for the second bank. We could stick with one bank and have the people deposit the $90 into that first bank, but it just makes all of this get complicated. It's easier if you just think about a second, second bank. Okay. So these borrowers, they take their $90 of currency, they go out and they buy stuff. The people who have received that $90 of currency are going to deposit it into the second bank. And so let's think about the second bank's assets and liabilities. So their asset, they're going to have, let's suppose that this bank does the same thing that bank does. This bank is going to keep part of that money, 10% in reserve, and they're going to lend out the rest. So let's start with the deposits. So this bank has deposits of $90. They're going to keep 10%, which is $9, in reserve. So they're going to have reserves of $9. And they're going to make loans of $81. And now the money supply has just increased again. So if we think about what happens to the money supply, it just increased by another $81. So now it's what, $271. And we can think about this going on and on. Suppose, so these people borrow $81, they go out and they take that currency and they buy stuff with it, and the people who receive that currency Let's suppose that we think about a third bank. So the people who received this $81 in currency, they're going to deposit it into their bank. Assets, liabilities, 
So this bank is going to take in $81 of deposits. They're going to keep 10%, which is $8.10 in reserve. And they're going to lend out the rest of it, which is $72.90. So they're going to make loans of $72.90. And now the money supply just increased by another $72.90. And we could continue this. Obviously, we could continue this over and over and over. And the amount that's being lent out each time is going to be dwindling. It's going to be dwindling by 10% at each step. What we want to do is think about what does the end result look like? If we if we just carried this to its logical extreme until the amount of, of loans being made went to zero, what does it look like? So let's ask this question. How much money is eventually created? That's what we're really interested in. If we think about the original deposit that original deposit was $100. Okay, so our money supply started out there. That bank lent, lent out $90. So it increased by another $90. And this $90, that is 10% multiplied by the 100 right there. Okay, that's where that came from. The next step was the $81, and that $81 is 10% of 90. And then the next step was $72.90, and that step was 10% of $81. Actually, these should be 90%, not the 10%. The 10% is held in reserve. The loan was 90%, so I need to correct those. 90% of each of the loan amounts. And this would continue. If we continued that, and we would need to use some mathematics, we would need to take a limit. We're, we don't need to worry about that because there's a nice easy way to figure out what the total amount is. The total money supply at the end of this process turns out to be $1,000. And we're going to think about how to calculate that. We're going to use the money multiplier and it's actually very easy to figure out what the total dollar amount is going to end up being. So that $100 of initial deposits generates $1,000 of money in the, mon in the uh, money supply, okay? So let's think about the money multiplier. The money multiplier is nice and simple. It's simply the inverse of the reserve ratio, the reciprocal of the reserve ratio. So let's write that out here. Money multiplier is the inverse or reciprocal of the reserve ratio. So if R is the reserve ratio, then the money supply or the money multiplier will be 1 over R. In our example, the reserve ratio was one-tenth. That means that the money multiplier in this example we're doing is 10 and that's how we got the total amount of money. We took that $100 initial deposit, we multiplied it by 10, that gives us $1,000 of money that ends up being created by this fractional reserve system. Now you have to be careful here. One of the things I always remind a class is that it, it, you have to make sure that you're working with the reserve ratio and not the percent. 
Okay, so let me give you another example here just to demonstrate one of the, the common mistakes that I see. So let's suppose I tell you that the reserve requirement is 5%. So the reserve requirement is equal to 5%. It's sometimes what a student d will do is they'll take this 5 and flip that over. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is write the reserve requirement as the reserve ratio. 5%, if we write that as a fraction, right, that's 5 one hundredths. And 5 one hundredths is 1 twentieth. And that's the thing you need to flip over. This is the reserve ratio. You need to flip that over so our money multiplier would end up being 20. So you don't want to flip the reserve requirement over. You want to convert the reserve requirement into a fraction. So our reserve require the reserve amount that the bank was holding was 10%. Well, if we write that as a fraction, that's one tenth. So just make sure to write whatever the reserve percent is, write that as a fraction, then flip that fraction over. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of what um, effect the banking system has on the money supply. It makes the job of the Fed more challenging. So now that we understand that, we're going to clear this off and then we'll talk about the tools that the Fed uses. Let's talk now about the tools that the Fed uses to manage the money supply. The first one is what we call open market operations. Open market operations. So the Federal Open Market Committee if it decides that it wants to increase or decrease the money supply, if they want to change the magnitude of the money supply, then they engage in what we refer to as open market operations. And what this means is that the Federal Open Market Committee will either buy U.S. government bonds or sell bonds. So they either buy or sell U.S. government bonds. And they do this on the open market. They would instruct their bond traders to go and buy bonds or sell bonds. Now let's think about the, what they do if they want to increase the money supply versus what they do if they want to decrease the money supply. So let's suppose that the Fed wants to increase the money supply. So what the Fed wants to do is put more dollars into the system. So the way they put more dollars into the system is they take some of their dollars, some of the Fed's dollars, and they need to buy something with it. So what they do is they buy U.S. government bonds from the general public on the open market. So to increase the money supply, they buy bonds. If they want to decrease the money supply, they do the opposite. So let's suppose I'm the Fed. If I've got these bonds and I want to get some of the dollars that are in the public's hands out of circulation, I need to sell them something. I need to get them to hand me some of their dollars in exchange for something. So to decrease the money supply, they sell bonds. Let's put here they buy bonds and sell bonds just so it's clear. Here's what I always tell my students. If This isn't something I would memorize. I, I don't have this kind of stuff memorized. I just think my way through it. I put myself into the position of the Fed and I say, okay, if I've got a stack of money right here and I wanted to get this stack of money into the system, what I need to do is I need to take this money and I need to buy stuff from people. And then I'm getting the stuff, the bonds, and the dollars are going into their hands. On the other hand, if I want to decrease the money supply, then I need to sell something to people. So I'm going to take some of the bonds that I've got, and I'm going to sell them to the general public, 
and now I'm going to have the money and they're going to have the bond. So this is a, a very commonly used tool by the Fed. Um, they use this tool more than any other tool that they've got at their disposal. They engage in open market operations. So that's the first one. The second one is that they can change the reserve requirement. The Fed can change how much banks have to hold in reserves. If they increase the reserve requirement, that's going to decrease the money multiplier. So we talked about what, I did two examples right over here where I had a, a reserve requirement first of 10% and then I lowered it to um, 5% and the money multiplier went from 10 to 20. So if they increase the reserve requirement, that decreases the money multiplier. So an, let's write that out. An increase in the reserve requirement leads to a decrease in the multiplier. So if the multiplier is smaller than any new deposit of money into the system, and remember it has to be a new deposit. I didn't talk a lot about that when we were talking about fractional reserve banking. But this has to be a new deposit into the system. If a person simply takes their money out of one bank and moves it to a different bank, then that's not going to change the money supply. But let's suppose you've got $100 buried in your backyard and you dig it up and you take that $100 and you deposit it into a bank. That is a new deposit and that new deposit will change the money supply. Okay. So, if we have a new deposit and the bank has to keep a larger chunk than before, then their loans are going to be smaller and it's going to have a smaller impact on the money supply. Now, the Fed doesn't use this tool very often. Changing the reserve requirement, they don't do it very often because they don't want to disrupt the business of banking. Banks keep those reserves because at any given time, they're going to have some people come into the bank that want some of their currency back and they need to be able to give it to them. On any particular day, it's not the case that everybody's going to come in and want their money back. Unless, of course, for some reason, people lose faith in that particular bank, which the Fed is vigilant. They, they do their best to make sure that, that it does not get out to the general public if a particular bank is in trouble. They quietly take care of the, the uh, problem. So on any given day, um, the bank is not going to need a whole lot of currency, and so they can keep that chunk that they need to in reserve. So the bank needs to know what it's going to have to keep in reserve for tomorrow and the next day, and so the Fed doesn't mess with the reserve requirement very, very often. The last tool that we're going to talk about is that the Fed can change the discount rate. So we talked about the discount rate just a little bit ago. The discount rate is the interest rate that the Fed charges a bank if that bank needs to borrow from the Fed. So remember that a bank can borrow from another bank, and the interest rate there we call the federal funds rate, but if a bank needs to borrow from the Fed, we call that amount that they have to pay to the Fed the discount rate. And so this is uh, the interest rate on loans that Fed, the Fed makes to banks, and they do this if a bank is running low on reserves. If a bank runs low on reserves, then they can borrow some money from the Fed to make sure that they don't um, uh, get below the, the reserve requirement, the amount that they have to uh, keep on hand. If the Fed increases the discount, discount rate, then that means borrowing is more costly from the, for the bank, from the Fed, and so they will take steps to reduce the probability that they have to borrow. They may keep some excess reserves. Remember, the bank does not have to keep the minimum amount. They can keep extra reserves, and we call that excess reserves, 
So the higher the discount rate, the more excess reserves the bank will keep so that it doesn't have to borrow from the Fed. And so if the Fed wants to decrease the money supply, they can increase the discount rate. So let's write that. Increasing the discount rate will lead to a decrease in the money supply. And the Fed does that frequently. They do change the discount rate. So those are the main tools that the Fed uses. Use this one most often, second most often. They don't change the reserve requirement very often at all. So let's finish this up by thinking about some problems in controlling the money supply. So problems for the Fed. There are a couple of them that we need to think about. The first one is that the Fed doesn't control the amount of money that households actually deposit in banks. So the Fed has no control over the amount of money that households deposit. And that's important because if households started to lose faith in the banking system and withdraw their money out of the banking system and just hold it in a jar in, in the cupboard or bury it in their backyard or just carry it around as cash in their pocket, then that means that there's dollars being withdrawn out of the banking system and the money supply is going to shrink. And so the Fed wants to ensure that people continue to have faith in the banking system. So the Fed doesn't have any control over that. Another problem for the Fed is that the Fed has no direct control over the amount of money that banks lend. So the Fed does not control how much money banks actually lend. So if you owned a bank, and let's suppose that the reserve requirement was 10%. The Fed says you have to keep 10%. You could keep 50% and loan 50% out. Or you could keep 70% and loan 30% out. And the Fed doesn't control that. The more that banks keep as reserves, the smaller the money multiplier and the smaller the impact of a deposit on the money system. So the Fed... These are some challenges for the Fed. Um, confidence in the banking system. There are times when it's high. There are times when people's confidence gets, gets shaken. And so the Fed needs to keep very careful. It needs to monitor closely what's happening with these so that it can adjust. If, if um, the Fed doesn't want the money supply to change, and then all of a sudden people start to lose faith in the banking system and withdraw their money, then the Fed has to try to take actions to counteract that effect. They might have to go out and, and engage in open market operations to try to counter the effect of people pulling their money out of the, uh, the system, out of the banking system. And so the Fed does, it's debatable how good of a job they, they do, um, there's actually a very interesting podcast, if you're interested, a Freakonomics podcast um, where uh, Stephen Dubner interviews Ben Bernanke about his role as the chairman of the Federal Reserve during the banking problems um, back in 2008. And it's a very interesting um, discussion that they have, and Ben Bernanke talks about the challenges that he had to face with uh, trying to figure out exactly what to do um, to uh, try to manage the uh, problems that were going on with the banking system. <clears throat> so, we'll come back to, when we talk about the Great Depression, we'll come back to this in a future um, video and talk a little bit about how well the Fed did managing um, the banking system back in the late 20s, early 30s, and it turns out they didn't do a very good job at all. Um, 
So we'll come back to that. Well, let's finish this up by just kind of summarizing what we talked about before with the uh, problems with a fractional system. And that is that anytime you've got a fractional banking system, there's always a possibility that there can be a run on, a, on the banks. And so that's one of the reasons that the Fed needs to make sure that it, it monitors carefully what's happening with consumer confidence. If there's a problem with a bank, um, the Fed does not advertise that. They go in and they, they do what they need to do to take care of the uh, financial problems with that bank so that um, if there is a problem with your bank, you typically wouldn't even know that. Um, your bank might change names. You might get a letter one day that says, hey, uh, Boatman's National Bank is now second bank of uh, whatever town you live in with the same great service that you've always enjoyed. And, and from your perspective, nothing's changed. Um, it's probably still got the same bank tellers and everything. It's just that probably that bank was not being managed correctly and the Fed went in and, and they made some changes. Um, and you don't need to know about that. If you did, you might start to panic. You might get scared, withdraw your money, and then we've got a real problem. So the Fed typically does a pretty good job of that. So hopefully that gives you an idea of kind of how the monetary system, at least with the U.S. works, um, the impact that um, banks have on the money system and the job that the Fed has to uh, try to tackle in monitoring the money supply. So I'll see you in a, a future video.